Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm joined in our studio by Issa Kohler Hausman, the author of the new book, Misdemeanor Land, Criminal Courts and Social Control in an Age of Broken Windows Policing. Issa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And listeners, please forgive my voice. It's Chicago, April, and 32 degrees outside. So accordingly, I have a cold. It is gross. I can (laughs) confirm. Well, thank you for joining us anyway. So this book, I believe, sprung from a dissertation that you wrote. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to write this book and what you felt was going unaddressed, really, and needed to be given a closer look? That's correct. I was living here in Chicago at the time, actually, and I'd started my PhD in sociology at Northwestern, and this was 2004, and at the time, mass incarceration had started to receive a huge amount of attention in social science and in the media. And as important and urgent as that issue seemed, I remember one day just after conversation with my sister, Julie Kohler Hausman, who is also a, a historian of criminal justice issues, going online and just Googling, I think there was a Google at the time, <laughs> just the arrest numbers for here in Cook County and noticing one simple fact. There's a lot more misdemeanor arrests than there are felony arrests. And so my research question basically just started out, huh, what's up with misdemeanors? I actually, there was a recent news story. Tragically, I believe a cop was killed and they looked at the man who's been arrested for that crime and, and the news media sort of blew up and said, he had 111 prior misdemeanor arrests. How did this happen? When you look at different populations, particularly inside cities, particularly minorities, is that level of misdemeanor arrests something that's actually fairly common, like you get picked up all the time? When we hear something like he had been arrested on 111 different Mm -hmm. misdemeanor counts prior to this, is that astonishing to you? It depends what you mean by astonishing. I mean, it's certainly not the most common experience for someone to have been arrested 100 times. I mean, if you see a number like that, I think most people can guess what's going on. Someone's probably homeless, struggling with a serious drug addiction, perhaps mental health issues. And let me just say, as tragic as it is that that ended up, that person ended up killing a police officer, I don't think there's even people who are arrested 100 times for misdemeanors. That's absolutely not a a predictive way of knowing who's going to go on to violent crime. But having said that, one of the most interesting things that I found from studying New York, because by the time I actually started this project, I had moved to New York City, which turned out to be an amazing place to study misdemeanor courts because it was the launching pad for a form of policing that has really been a very popular model, and it's been adopted in different ways um, across the country, which is sometimes called broken windows or quality of life or order maintenance policing. So New York City innovated this model of policing that was designed, that had as its sort of central theoretical claim that attention to low-level offending, so focusing on misdemeanors, violations, infractions, was the key to maintaining urban order and to actually disrupting serious violent crime. So when this was adopted in New York City in the early to mid-90s, you know, New York was suffering under just really tragically high levels of violent crime. And so one of the things that I noticed just from looking at New York City data, and I haven't been able to find this in other cities, it's very hard, New York actually has amazing data, is that the biggest expansion in arrests were for people who didn't have prior criminal convictions. And so this is a long way of kind of getting back to that question, which is at least in New York City, most people who are arrested for misdemeanor crimes are not people that have extensive records of the criminal justice system. Now, often certain communities, as you mentioned, are highly policed for various reasons. So lots of people end up with maybe two to five misdemeanor arrests within a period of maybe ages, you know, 16 to 40. And often what's interesting is many of those don't result in a criminal conviction, but 100 misdemeanor arrests usually indicates there's something else going on. Now, just to give our listeners sort of a foundational grounding for this discussion, there are the criminal courts that we always think of when we think of, you know, arrests and crime and and the show law and order. And then there's what you call misdemeanor land. Can you explain the difference between those two courts, both philosophically and, you know, the impact on your life? Yeah, Great question. And in fact, let's sort of take it one step back. What's the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony? So most states define misdemeanors and felonies as, you can just think of them as ranking of the seriousness of the class of criminal law or penal law. And so felonies, 
basically encompass what we think of as more serious acts. So murder, assault, high amounts of drug possession even, or of narcotic sales. And then misdemeanors are essentially a class of criminal conduct that's against the law, right? It's prescribed, but it's just by virtue of definition, a lesser class of criminal conduct. So it's just think of misdemeanors as sort of the class of penal law rules that is still against the law, but they're less serious definitionally. And they're usually definitionally less serious because the legislature authorizes lesser penalties for that class. And then within both felonies and misdemeanors, there's another grading system, most states by letter. So an A felony is usually the most serious felony, whereas an E felony would be less serious. And similarly for misdemeanors, most states have something like an A or B. And in most states, though not all, misdemeanors are defined as criminal law prescriptions. I mean, so in most states, misdemeanors are defined as rules that if they're broken, you cannot get more than a year in jail. That's in most states, and that's true in New York. So therefore, many states also have a different type of courts that handle different types of offenses. Now, this varies wildly because, you know, we have 50 states, and then there's differences between municipal jurisdictions, of course. In New York, the lower criminal courts, that's actually called criminal court, has jurisdiction over misdemeanors and unindicted felonies, and the higher criminal courts, which if you've watched Law & Order, you might actually know in New York are confusingly called Supreme Court, handle indicted felonies. Okay. So now that we understand the difference between felonies and misdemeanors, let's circle back around to the theory behind broken windows policing. And it's one of those things that, you know, I remember hearing in the 90s and, you know, 2000s, but how much research has there been done to actually back up the central claims. Obviously, we know that crime in New York City has fallen. Does the data suggest that it is actually, can we draw a straight line saying this theory of broken windows policing has led to this drop in violent crime and serious crimes that we would charge people with felonies for? The short answer is that nobody knows and anybody that tells you that they know why crime in New York City declined is either running for something or lying, which unfortunately tends to be the same thing these days. But just so the listeners are familiar with the broken windows model, in 1982, a criminologist and a political scientist, Keeling and Wilson, published an article in The Atlantic called Broken Windows. And what's interesting about the article is that it actually starts with what we say in social science as null findings. So they basically started with a story about a policing experiment where cops were taken out of cars, they were put on a foot patrol, and they were told to focus on the small things in a community. So breaches of public peace, littering, public urination, the types of things that a community might say makes it feel disorderly. And the claim was that this is something that people actually care about. And this was, again, the 80s. Crime had been rising for a while. There was a lot of concern about serious violent street crime. But the claim of these two authors was that people actually also care about public order and signs of sort of civility in public spaces. They had another claim that when those things were enforced, it sort of stopped a developmental sequence whereby people who might be inclined to commit serious property crime or violent crime felt sort of authorized to do it because they didn't see law and order enforced around them. So they had two claims. One was that people actually cared about the small stuff inherently, and the other is that if by enforcing low-level infractions, it actually would stop some sort of social process whereby people felt comfortable committing serious crimes. So this article, this claim, I mean, it really was just a hypothesis. Again, that's what's so important to remember, was picked up by Bill Bratton, who at the time in the early 90s was the head of the transit police in New York City. And the subways were a site of a lot of crime and a lot of discomfort and fear for residents in New York City. And he really believed that if he applied this model, that he could make a dent in, in these issues in New York City. And he actually hired, I believe it was Keeling, to be a consultant at this time. So then he goes to be the head of the Boston police, and then he comes back and takes the helm of the NYPD after Giuliani is elected in 1994. And they roll this out as a citywide model, right? They say that we're going to enforce these prescriptions against minor offending, so the classic squeegee men or vending without a license or public urination, turnstile jumping. And we believe that this is something the New Yorkers care about, and we also believe that it's going to make a dent in serious violent crime. Now, by the time they put this model into place, this is 1995 when it starts going in, 
Violent and street crime in New York peaked in 1991, so it already was on a downswing. I don't think anyone knew at the time the trend would continue because, again, New York had been traumatized by very serious high crime for a long time. But this was actually instituted about four years after violent and street crime peaked in New York and it already was on a decline. And it doesn't, in some sense, what's interesting about misdemeanor arrests in this model is that it actually expands much more furiously in the Bloomberg decade, which is around the 2000 to 2010, at a time that New York had long been experiencing a historically low levels of violent and property crime. So misdemeanor arrests really continue to go up years, if not about 15 years after it was clear that there was a stable low level of violent crime. So that's both to say the sort of the preliminary story in my book is is really just how the courts came to be flooded with these cases, but also to answer your question that it's hotly debated the role that this policing actually played in bringing down crime in New York City. Now, there are three populations that I'd like to talk about how they were impacted by this theory of broken windows policing, what we've you know now seen nearly, it'll be going on 20, 20, 20 25 odd, years, 25 years. And those three populations are the police who are expected to implement this, the court agents who then have to process and deal with the people who have you know been arrested for these various misdemeanors, and then the residents of the city and the people who get caught up in the broken windows policing trolls. Right. So could you talk first about the cops, how this changed their work and their outlook? And right. I believe CopStat was coming in at about the same time. So there were some elements that were converging, especially in New York City, that really drove some of this. So could you talk a little bit about that? That's correct. CopStat is probably one of the most important changes in modern policing that has received a lot of attention. But so for people who aren't familiar with it, it's there's some debate actually as to where the word comes from. Some people say that it came from compare statistics or computer statistics, because of course at this time it was fairly new. So one of the most innovative things that happened in New York is that there was a decision to try to gather real-time data about complaints. So when someone goes into a precinct and says, someone robbed me or someone assaulted me, that's a complaint, right? And not every complaint translates into an arrest because of course sometimes things happen that it's impossible to or they do not locate the perpetrator. So those are complaints. And then, of course, arrests. And the police wanted to gather real-time information about when those were happening in order to make patrol and deployment decisions and also to try to hold precinct commanders and different parts of the organization accountable. So a police organization is a huge organization. It's like a firm or a business. And it's very difficult to figure out how to manage an organization like this, how to measure what enforcement or quality is. So CompStat came up with one way, and one way was to basically measure crime rates at a more regular time interval. So that started being possible in the 1990s. And another way is to actually measure enforcement. So one of the stories that I tell in the book is that I think that we underestimate the effect of this kind of banal change in management where suddenly the police commanders were able to see and observe minor changes in crime rates in very short order, in a short amount of time. It used to be that you had to wait months to know what the crime rate or the arrest numbers were, right? And the other was that they had adopted this philosophy that believed that low-level enforcement was an effective mechanism, whether or not they actually knew that to be true, but that was the philosophy that was driving this model of policing. And so essentially, because the whole management structure was holding everyone below it sort of accountable for any change in crime rates, beat cops came to feel this deep fear that in their precinct, there would be some small increase in the index crime rate. And the only thing that they had to offer higher up in the command that the brass, as they they say, which are the police, the commanders in the organization, you know, that they're concerned about seeing an increase in crime rate. But the only thing that they had to offer them to show that they were doing something proactively about that were basically enforcement, low-level enforcement numbers. So in New York, that was summonses, which are the little pink tickets you get for infractions or violations or misdemeanor arrests. And then after, interestingly, after the city had initial settlement of the first wave case around stop, question, and frisk, they were required to keep these forms for every stop number. And those were called UF-250s. And that was later. This was not in the 90s. This was more in the 2000s. And what's interesting is that it came to be that those numbers were actually good numbers, right? So beat cops felt this pressure when they turned in their activity report at the end of every month. That's what showing that you were a good cop meant. So the organization itself started to believe 
this is how we measure quality policing was quantity of these types of low-level numbers. And then the people in the middle of the management hierarchy felt that they were responsible for any change in crime rates and that the only thing you could do to show that you were doing something was to have more of these numbers. So I think really what happened in New York, and we've seen that interrupted recently, which is another interesting story, was that for years there was this sort of cycle whereby there was more and more misdemeanor arrests, I think precisely because the management of the NYPD didn't really know how else to manage, how to sort of measure what quality or active enforcement would be. And recently, we've seen a lot of political resistance to that finally, and the numbers are starting to come down and all litigation around these issues. But so that's the story about how the courts came to be flooded with these types of cases. And just to jump in really quickly, you know, you say in the book, the number of misdemeanors you can find is just limited by, you know, the time you have and how intensely you feel that you want to drag them down. I think that if my listeners are honest with themselves is I had to be honest with myself reading this book. I think about all the times I did something that I could have been, you know, someone could have given me a ticket. Every time you jaywalked, if you were a dirtbag teen and you were, you know, taking your Sharpie and writing on a subway wall, if you, you know, got in a playground, like so many things that we do and don't think of ourselves as having, quote unquote, committed a crime or we think about ourselves, we don't think about ourselves as criminals, but all of those little violations, if the cops are interested in driving up those numbers, they absolutely can. You know, people do those things all the time. That's correct. I mean, I think almost any time you look at changes in misdemeanor arrest numbers, what you're looking at is changes in enforcement choices. Misdemeanor arrests are largely proactive. There are some what are called complaint driven, right? So assault in the third in New York is, you know, that's going to be a complaint driven for the most part. However, that could also be an artifact of some type of enforcement. But a lot of, certainly in the largest era of breaking windows policing are what we call proactive or officer driven. So you can find as many as you look for because there's a lot of low level offending, especially in big cities. And so the question is always, you know, how much resources are put into that. And so what's interesting about the misdemeanor land story in New York City is that this policing change was intentional, right? It was very well thought out. It had a theory behind it. Now, there's a lot of disagreement with the premises of the theory, and there's a lot of smart writing on disagreeing with that. And that's certainly not my question to sort that out. But it was intentional. It was well thought out. It was well funded, right? This is at a time where there's this huge increase in the patrol strength and in the ranks of the NYPD. But what was so interesting to me is that what wasn't thought out, what seemed to have been given almost no attention, was what the hell was going to happen to all these people once they got to court. I mean, you're talking about a change in law enforcement that's basically doubling the volume of human beings that are put in handcuffs and sent in custody into the city's courthouses. And not only was it not well thought out, it seems to be that it was sort of deliberately underfunded. As far as I could tell, there was no proportionate increase in the funding for the various organizations that make up the criminal justice, quote unquote, system, such that it is, right? So whether that be the court itself and its court personnel, judges, prosecutors, and certainly not defense attorneys. And that was led to a very famous incident in New York City, which is right around this time, the main public defender organization, the Legal Aid Society. One of the precipitating reasons of the very famous strike that happened in 1996, I hope I'm getting that date right, was that they were just so flooded with cases and underfunded and basically felt that they couldn't do their job of providing defense as constitutionally required to their clients. So that was really my question. What happens to criminal courts that are charged with doing something with this huge volume of arrests that they're sent by this intentional police experiment when their resources don't increase proportionally. And again, what's so interesting about misdemeanors is that it's different than what you might expect would happen from felonies, right? So the courts have been flooded before, for example, interestingly, much later than when they passed, but about eight years, 10 years after the Rockefeller drug laws passed, drug arrests started going up at a very high rate in New York City. And 
prosecutors indicted a higher percentage of those and a higher percent to prison. And that was sort of consistent with the message that was happening with around drugs in the 80s, right? We're going to take this very seriously. This is a plague on, on our communities. We need to... So this sort of political rhetoric matched what the punitive response was, though there was this very interesting lag that happened. And that's another topic that should be studied. But you had in New York City the same rhetoric around so the valence of misdemeanor crimes. These are serious. We need to take them seriously. And they flood the courts. So the question is, what happens? What do these court actors do? And you talk about how the traditional expectations of courts are that they have essentially two jobs, adjudicate, so decide mm -hmm. whether someone is innocent or guilty, and then sentence. So how did this influx impact what we traditionally think of as that's your job, that your job is the court, mm -hmm. adjudication and sentencing? Right. For the listeners that are lawyers, that's what you were taught in law school. What's the role of criminal courts? Criminal law basically has this list of things you're not allowed to do. That's the substantive criminal law, right? Felonies and misdemeanors are a list of things that you're not allowed to do in our society. And then they have sentences, potential sentences attached to them. And the role of criminal courts is to do two things. And even those of you who are, didn't go to law school, again, and you've, you know, you've had your legal education through law and order, right? The police in the first part of the show go out and find someone that ostensibly did something on that list of stuff you're not allowed to do. And then what's the second part of the show? Well, the second part of the show is what we have a fancy word for called adjudication. And that's what the criminal process is supposed to be about, right? So the rules of criminal procedure say... This is how you're allowed to go about investigating and essentially trying someone who is accused of doing one of the things on that list. And that's what we think the role of courts is. The role of courts is to sort the people that have been accused by the police on the question of factual guilt or innocence and then decide what a proper punishment is that's proportionate to blameworthiness and culpability. But what's so fascinating about what happened in this era is that I claim that there has been this massive transformation as to what the criminal courts have actually done. So the courts are flooded with these arrests starting in the mid-90s. And one of the most fascinating things that you see, which is contrary to expectations, that the conviction rate would go up or at least stay the same. Because again, this is all motivated by a model that says we haven't been taking low-level offending seriously. And we need to take it really seriously, guys, because this is the key to urban order. And this is the key to bringing down violent crime in New York City. But what happens? Well, what happens is that the dismissal rate goes up substantially. The criminal conviction rate, meaning the proportion of misdemeanor cases each year that terminate in a conviction to a misdemeanor crime, goes down such that in recent years, more than 50% of misdemeanor cases result in some form of a dismissal and less than 20% results in a criminal conviction. And the remainder, about that 30%, results in what's called a, a violation. So a non-criminal conviction, usually to this very vague statute that many people think <laughs> is not even constitutional to convict people to anymore because it's so vague and unclear, which is disorderly conduct. I make the joke that it's like the Madonna offense, right? Causing a commotion. I mean, that's essentially the, <laughs> the, the legal definition of the offense. So this is a fascinating outcome. And one of the things that I try to do in the book is say, well, what, what sense do we make of this? Well, there's a couple lessons that you might initially draw. One is that the courts were just overloaded and it was a pressure valve. They basically just threw out a bunch of cases because they couldn't handle dealing with them. Another would be that as you expanded policing on these cases, you basically brought in a lower quality arrest, right? So if you think the courts are actually adjudicating cases on their merits, so if there's an unlawful stop or search or seizure, right, so they're throwing it out on some sort of criminal procedure grounds or the facts are weak. So one, another, you know, hypothesis would be that they're actually just poor quality arrests and courts are doing their job and they're throwing the cases out. And I say neither is really right. I believe that what's happening and I have a lot of evidence, and we can talk about that to, to make sense of this model. I say, you know what, we should think about what the courts are doing as not throwing cases out because they're just overwhelmed. And I certainly found no evidence that they're actually adjudicating these cases. Because another thing that happened is that the biggest expansion of when these cases were resolved was at arraignments. And what arraignment is, is the very first court appearance. So you're arrested... And now under New York state law, because of a case I believe actually brought by the Legal Aid Society, you have to see a judge within 24 hours. So 
it's not, you know, you don't need the whole episode of legal, of law and order. What's so fascinating is that in the majority of these cases, at the height, it was about two thirds of the arrests go to their final legal disposition within 24 hours after arrest. So it's very hard to make the argument that's what's happening is that the courts are actually engaging complex questions of facts and law in order to come to a legal resolution at arraignment. Because remember, there's somewhere between 60 and 120 cases at a normal arraignment shift that lasts about six and a half hours of operative court time, right? So I say that neither of those are really what's happening in New York. So now let's talk about the experience of New Yorkers, the experiences of citizens who now have to put up with being more closely policed for lower level offenses. I think that it may, on a theoretical basis, be easy to say, oh, well, you know, it's not, we're not charging them with felonies. We're not causing massive harm, but let's take a deeper look at collateral consequences. What can being arrested for misdemeanors or a series of misdemeanors lead to in a person's life? Right. So in order to answer that, I'm going to step back and say what the sort of positive argument in the book is, which is that I believe that the best way to understand what's happening in New York City's lower courts in this era of broken windows policing is that the courts are essentially engaging in a large-scale process of what I call management. So I say that the best way to understand it is through, and this is just a theoretical term, we could use anything, is what I call the managerial model. And on that model, what the courts are trying to do is basically sort, manage, and test people over time. So instead of deciding what they're going to do with the case based on guilt and innocence, which is, you know, the law and order adjudicative model, the what we're taught in law school, what the courts are doing is saying, I'm going to decide what to do with this case based on some impression that I have about what type of person you are. So instead of saying, I'm going to decide what to do with you on your first turnstile jump case based on actually figuring out if the police had probable cause to stop and arrest you, and then therefore if there's sufficient evidence to show that you actually jumped the turnstile. Instead, what they're going to do is say, well, look, you've never been arrested before. So I don't know if you jumped the turnstile or not. And frankly, it would take me a lot of work and a lot of resources to figure that out because it's quite complicated. You say you didn't jump the turnstile. The police officer says you did. Instead, what I'm going to do is basically temporarily mark you, put you back into the world, and then see if you cycle back through. So in New York, what that involves is what's called an adjournment and contemplation of dismissal. And lots of other jurisdictions have something similar and essentially just leaves the case open for six months and for some instances for a year. And if you're not rearrested, the case is just dismissed and sealed. Now, if you are rearrested, that's when the courts say, well, maybe I'm going to ask for something more or maybe I'm going to look at other sort of data points. So one of the most interesting things that happens is that it's not just about the legal facts of the case. The courts actually look at different things like, are you employed? Are you the type of person that shows up to court? Are you bringing me a letter from a program that you're involved in that shows that you're a responsible person? So there's all this sort of indicia about being a governable person, about being a person that's involved in the labor market, involved in family, this much more it seems like nothing to do with the actual alleged offense, right? But sort of textured notion of what it is to be a sort of quote unquote good person that is driving what happens to these cases. And so what that means for the people, to circle back to your question, that are targeted for this is that they're sort of under this long-term obligation to prove that they are worthy of being set free again after being arrested for this or that they're a responsible person. So it's a very different type of logic that's happening. And of course, the most important thing to keep our eye on is that there's certain populations that are much more heavily burdened by these requirements because those are the populations that are policed than others. And it probably won't surprise most of your readers to know that the most heavily policed spaces in New York City and therefore, the places that have the highest rates of misdemeanor arrests are poor minority neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, and I thought this was very poignant in the book, you talk about how when you're caught up in this sort of evaluation process, when you feel like, you know, you're being hassled, you don't step back and think about what are the large systemic factors that have led to this? You see, oh my God, this police officer, this parole officer, this therapist who I've been sent to on this, you know, program, the people that you come into direct contact with are the ones that you, you know, resent and blame. 
and start to lose faith in and are you concerned, you, you know, you talk about how you approach this first as a lawyer and then as a citizen. Mm -hmm. As citizens, how do you think we should be responding to this and acting in such a way that we maintain any sort of respect for the system mm -hmm. and earn people's trust and faith as court actors? You're right. There's a lot of different ways to approach this. And I found myself very torn, I think, in writing this book and speaking about it. A lot of people want me to give a very easy, straightforward set of policy implications. And I suppose that's just the problem of studying something for so long and with so many different actors. I spend a lot of time with prosecutors. I spend a fair amount of time with police officers, defense attorneys, judges. And maybe I think I've always had this, you know, I would cry at AT&T commercials and Disney movies and I'm just excessively empathetic, I guess. I found myself really understanding the motivations and the constraints of every single actor that I spent time with. And I think it's often very short-sighted to say, you know, what's wrong is what these actors are doing. I mean, what I really think is wrong is that we are essentially using the criminal justice system, both with misdemeanors and broken windows policing and mass incarceration to solve what are very, very serious social problems that have come from economic dislocation, a history of racism and discrimination and in our country, you know, a decline in the union movement that was, of course, the result of intentional policy trying to <laughs> weaken labor. I mean, and these things let lead to very real social problems. I mean, crime in the 90s in New York was a tragedy and it was primarily a tragedy for the low income communities of color who saw their sons murdered, who saw their communities living in unsafe conditions, who saw people lost to drug addiction. And I worked as a defense attorney and I still actually represent people who are serving life sentences for crimes committed as juveniles. And these people's lives are ruined too. I mean, they grew up in a time where violence was all that was offered to them. And so many of my clients are so reflexive now on how terrible violence is, what it's done, how they've harmed their victims and their victims' families. And they didn't want to have those options. They didn't want to grow up in that world. You know, there's this line from a <laughs> R. Kelly and Jay-Z song where they talk about, you know, young men who never chose the life that they chose. And that's true about my clients. But And so these things are real. And yet I find it just a moral tragedy that the only thing we can imagine doing is just policing more and having more punitive responses when we know that the costs are going to fall on the same communities that are suffering under violence and social insecurity and economic insecurity. Of course, that's what's going to happen, right? So you cast this wide net of misdemeanor policing and stopping and frisking. Of course, it's going to happen that you're going to humiliate and arrest the young men who are poor and minority that are living in those communities. That's where they were born. And they're going to have the one, the, the experiences of this. And I just, that seems to be left out of our calculus when we decide how to affect this. So, that's just a much larger political question that we have to deal with as a community, as a political community. I think we're morally obligated to deal with that. I mean, as a lawyer, I have lots of sort of, I call them tinker responses, and they're not tinkers. They're actually quite important. And a big thing is actually sealing non-conviction records. New York is one of the few states that has very strong sealing laws. Unfortunately, the NYPD and a lot of prosecutors' offices as a matter of policy, violate those laws. And I hope that someone will take them to task for that. So they maintain, use, and share what should be sealed records all the time. But in other jurisdictions, it's not even against the law to do that, right? So in other jurisdictions, arrests that don't terminate in a criminal conviction, you know, if you are even acquitted at trial, that still prints on your rap sheet, that can be uh, accessed, that's circulated, and that's horribly harmful, of course, to the most vulnerable communities, the people that are trying to get jobs, trying to get housing, that are at the highest risk of arrests that don't lead to convictions. And I think that just has to be a national movement that states across the country need to say, we're going to seal, we're not going to make these available. And in this era of big data, it's just incredibly dangerous to allow those records to circulate the way that they do with the ease that they do right now. Well, to sort of bring us to the end of our podcast, I'd love for you to read us a passage from Misdemeanor Land. And I have marked it here. And this comes from your conclusion. And I just thought it was a great summation of so many of the issues in the book. The ostensible objectives of these policing practices, much like the reforms that have led to mass incarceration, are to reduce the incidence of violence and social harm. It may well be that the people living in, quote, 
social insecurity and marginality whose life prospects have been circumscribed, quote, in the wake of the twofold retrenchment of the labor market and the welfare state, are more likely to commit misdemeanor crimes. That's a quote from Louis Vacant. And it may well be that we have good reason for deploying a high number of police officers to poor and minority neighborhoods because they suffer disproportionately from violent crime. And these policing techniques may indeed be effective in creating order and repressing serious crime, although that question is hotly debated among social scientists who have studied the issue. Insofar as the techniques are effective, the crime reduction benefits from these policing strategies accrue to the residents of these neighborhoods. But the costs of these strategies fall on the same people, and the costs are tremendous. The residents inside these communities are those who come to have criminal records that hinder their employment and housing prospects, endure the degradation of arrest and prosecution, lose days of work and childcare, and face interminable demands to go back and forth to court to deal with arrests and summonses for low-level infractions. They increasingly feel disrespected and oppressed by a police presence designated for their safety and demeaned by a legal system designed to dole out justice. As long as we as a society are comfortable securing social control and order primarily with the tools of criminal law and punishment, this will be the case. Well, Issa, thank you so much for joining us again. I've been speaking with Issa Kohler-Hausman about her book, Misdemeanor, Criminal Courts and Social Control in an Age of Broken Windows Policing. And Issa, if our listeners are interested, not just in picking up misdemeanor land, but in finding out more about your work, where could they go? Sure. I have a faculty website. I'm not very good at internet stuff through Yale and links to it is a data project that I'm working on. And you'll see additional maps and data by my brilliant um, research assistants have worked with me on that. And I don't do social media. I can't handle that to sensory overload. So sorry, you won't be able to find me on social media and you should all probably get off it too. (laughs) Well, I will link to that faculty website for our readers on abajournal.com. Thank you again, Issa, for joining us. And thank you to our listeners of the Modern Law Library. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review on your favorite podcast listening service. That's a big help for us. Thanks so much.